Welcome to the first panel of the Development Policy Discussion Days, titled with Feminism, Free Trade and Policy Frameworks. How could a German feminist trade policy contribute to a fair North-South trade? My name is Susanne Neubert, and I'm the director of the Center for Rural Development at the Humboldt University. As you might know, SLE specializes on, on lecturing, researching, training, as well as consulting different methods and approaches with the goal to contributing to a paternalism-free development cooperation. Though the global north, of course, has still a long way to go in order to achieve this goal, we think that we are slowly but surely getting better by adapting more partner-oriented attitudes and thinking. So you are invited to work together with us in this field. A warm welcome to the audience, to the audience joining us online and to the panelists who will be introduced later. Now I would like to name the participants of our postgraduate study program who have conceptualized and organized this panel and who will also moderate it. Nina Hack, Tanja Holbe, Konstantin Münchau, Jana Summer, Aaron Tankala and Sophie Fey. A big thank you to Elena Gnant and Annika Buchholz for the coordination of this event. Thank you also to the translators who will simultaneously translate this panel discussion into German. As already mentioned, our topic is what actually is a feminist trade policy and how could, for example, a German feminist trade policy look like? Now, the floor is open to Sarah Ribbert from the Heinrich Böll Foundation. She will give you some more information about this panel. Thank you. Thank you, Susanne. So also from my side, a very warm welcome to everyone who has joined. For now 22 years, the Center for Rural Development has been organizing the development policy discussion days in close cooperation with the Heinrich Böll Foundation. And I think it's wonderful that we continue with this tradition also this year. And I believe that themes could not be more timely and relevant than those that were chosen. Some of you may wonder how and why we ended up choosing this very specific topic of feminist trade policy and why we do not talk more broadly about feminist development policy or feminist foreign policy. With the foreign, with the guidelines that were presented in March this year by, the, by Germany's Foreign Minister Annalena Baerbock, as well as Development Minister Svenja Schulze, I think there's certainly a lot to discuss. But what we would like to do in today's session is to take this from a more general to a concrete level and discuss how a feminist approach could be implemented in the trade sector. The EU and its predecessors stand as successful models for greater prosperity through economic trade. However, not everyone benefited in the same way from this cross-border trade. It is not gender neutral and often happens at the expense of women and other minorities. If you take a look at both strategies of the ministries, both acknowledge this fact and mention trade as one sector where the representation and participation of women should be strengthened and the need better integrated. If you now add the North South dimension to this and the injustice that often goes along with this, uh, I think this undertaking to reform trade relations in a feminist way is far from being an easy one. And one important question in this context that I would like to raise for this panel is if countries like Germany can make equitable gender relations a precondition for the trade, or if this only creates new colonial structures by interfering in the sovereign decision-making processes of exporting countries. I'm very curious to see what answers the panel will come up with today, and I'm happy to welcome the three panelists, Ms. Christina Ackenberg, Co-Chair Supervisory Board at the Fair Trade Germany, 
Dr. Boris Christoph Hoffmann, who is a member of the German Bundestag, and Ms. Libohan Nicola Poko, who is working for the Trade Collective Think Tank in South Africa. Thank you all for coming, and uh, I will now hand over to the moderators who will introduce this still a bit more detailed. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Susanne and Sarah, for your introduction and setting the stage for us in our panel discussion today. And a warm welcome to everyone to our panel discussion on feminism, free trade, policy and policy frameworks with the question, how could a German feminist trade policy contribute to fair North-South trade? My name is Taufe Aaron, and on behalf of my co-moderator, Nina Harp, and our entire organizing team, I would like to welcome you to today's panel discussion, the first in the series of three. We will be supported by Yana in the background, who would later on run some insightful uh, polls with the tool Mentimeter. Tanya and Constantine are going to manage your questions in the chat, so don't hesitate to post all your questions you have in the question and answer tool. Uh, before we start, some basic housekeeping rules. Well, uh, in case you, uh, you face any technical challenges, we ask you to post your questions in the question and answer tool, and our technical team will come very quickly to your help. For the question and answer tool, you can find the icon at the bottom of your screen. And for those wishing to access the German translation, you can also find the globe at the bottom of your screen, and there you can choose the language you would like to listen in. This panel discussion will be held entirely in English, and there would be a simultaneous German translation. During our time together, we are going to, oh, sorry. During our time together, we are going to start by laying the context within which we are talking about a feminist trade policy. We'll look at the possible solutions that can consider intersectional discrimination and open the panel to questions for the audience. During the session, we would have open Mentimeter questions to get the audience involved to share their thoughts on the topic. Uh, if you do have any technical questions, please do not hesitate to post them in the chat. And for your question and answer tool, for, your, for the question and answer session, there would be a time allocated for it at the, after the discussions where your questions can be asked directly to the panelists. Please, when asking your question, please state the panelists to whom you would like to ask your question, and at the end, this or state if it's an open question wherein any of the panelists can answer. For now, I would hand over to my colleague Jana, who is going to lead us through the first Mentimeter. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Aaron. So before we come to the introductory part, I would like to introduce to you to Mentimeter, which for the ones not familiar with it, is a participatory tool that we will be using today to also give a voice to our audience. So we would like you to ask, we would like to ask you to um, click on the link that I just posted in the chat below. Um, and then once you do that, you can also use your phone to scan the barcode you see up here on the screen. This should lead you to Mentimeter where you can answer our first que question today, which is, uh, in which areas in society, as well as our daily lives, do you think we need feminist trade the most? So feel free to answer this question in the next few minutes, and we will come back to your answers uh, later on, and are looking forward to your input. So while you have some time to check out Mentimeter, um, I just realized my camera turned off. Yeah, I am again. So while you are checking out Mentimeter, we will now give you a bit more context on the topic of feminist trade in form of a small video presentation, which will be shared momentarily.
Trade is not gender neutral. Women are affected differently by trade than men. A structural gender bias within global trade frameworks leads to societal discrimination and furthers gender-based inequality. Especially along the north-south axis, the global imbalance of power is reflected in implications of trade. While trade policies and free trade agreements may not purposefully exclude women, they bear the potential of reproducing existing gendered asymmetries and inequalities. In the context of today's heavily globalized markets, women are among those most negatively affected in their multiple roles as workers, producers, consumers and caretakers. While economic development over the last decades have inarguably created job opportunities for women, many of these jobs are primarily embedded in global supply chains and export-oriented sectors such as textiles, garments or agriculture, where employment for women remains labor-intensive, low-paid and dangerous. A prominent example is the position of female farmers facing trade liberalization. While medium and large-scale producers often profit, smallholder farmers are more likely to suffer from free trade rules, as they lack control over agricultural production as well as access to land, credit and local markets. This especially affects women, who are often smallholder farmers, and in addition to their unpaid work as caretakers, they are pushed into paid work when land earlier used for subsidence farming is converted to land for export-oriented production. This is one of the many examples of how free trade rules often worsen the position of female workers, increasing their workload immensely. The first step to tackle these gender-based inequalities is an acknowledgement and policymaking. Feminist trade policies pose a chance to transform the gender-blind approach to trade systems by addressing the root causes of discrimination, exploitation and exclusion of women and other marginalized groups. Such policies should be carefully formulated to not recreate patronizing interventions, but rather develop the course of action in cooperation with the various actors of global trade, especially the most vulnerable groups in the Global South. Considering that women in trade are affected by various types of discrimination, a feminist trade policy should adopt an intersectional approach. Discrimination due to gender, ethnicity and socio-economic status intersects to create new hurdles for the affected and can thus not be dealt with in isolation. This entails that a feminist trade policy is not just for women. When we talk about women, we mean women in all their diversity, as well as other gender identities outside the binary gender framework that has prevailed for centuries. Although women are the biggest marginalized and discriminated group worldwide, feminist trade policies serve all kinds of marginalized groups. The feminist policy's fundamental aim should be the promotion of human rights, gender justice, and opportunities to benefit from trade for everyone. The proven implications of trade for gender inequality call for an explicitly formulated feminist trade policy. Existing initiatives, such as the inclusion of gender chapters in free trade agreements, are important first steps. However, separate chapters have little effect if they are non-binding and not harmonized with the rest of the agreement. Gender must not remain an add-on perspective, but must be understood transversally. A feminist trade policy aims to eliminate these structural and systemic causes of inequality and enable equal access to and participation in trade. While several nations worldwide have adopted a gender-sensitive approach to their trade policies, only a few countries have officially proclaimed a feminist approach to foreign or development policies, including Sweden, Luxembourg, France, Libya, Mexico and Chile. Policies and implementation methods in these countries vary from conducting gender-based trade policy analysis to implementing government-led procurement programs in order to help increase gender-inclusive growth. Chile, for example, has created an action plan for the country's biggest e-commerce platform that aims to identify women-owned businesses and increase their visibility, simplify purchasing processes and provide training to female business owners. Other countries have put a focus on financial inclusion measurements to overcome gender-specific barriers constraining women's involvement in trade. In 2009, faced with the continuous feminization of poverty, the government of Rwanda created a number of funds for local women-owned firms. This provides alternative access to finances and funding, independent from gender-exclusionary bank loans, 
and successfully increased women's access to financial loans. Despite the diversity of these policies, many share a common focus on four key areas, namely rights, resources, and representation as well as diversity. Equal rights are a fundamental necessity for overcoming systemic and structural causes of inequality in trade. This includes the right to own and inherit property, as well as the freedom to choose one's occupation and to participate in all levels of society. In addition, equal access to resources such as financial products and services, as well as knowledge and education, is essential for women to fully participate in trade. Finally, representation and diversity in social, political and economic dimensions ensures participation in political offices as well as social and economic decision-making processes on equal terms. Germany has already taken its first steps towards a feminist trade policy. In March 2023, Germany's Federal Minister for Foreign Affairs, Annalena Baerbock, and the country's Federal Minister for Economic Cooperation and Development, Svenja Schulze, simultaneously published guidelines on two newly spun feminist policy frameworks. Both frameworks outline an intersectional feminist approach to policy making in their respective policy domains. Initiatives such as the German Supply Chain Act, implemented in 2023, aim to break up existing power structures and increase equal access to the benefits of international trade. Tackling the exploitation of workers in the highly feminized textile industry, this policy requires the implementation of transparent and accessible grievance mechanisms. This aims to protect workers from exploitation and improve access to adequate financial compensation. Nevertheless, despite these efforts, Existing trade-related objectives of Germany's newly formulated feminist foreign and development policies within the EU trade policies do not adequately respond to existing gender inequalities. Germany, in its role as the largest economy in the European Union and one of the world's largest trading partners, should thus take up its responsibility and formulate a feminist trade policy. Hello everyone, um, my name is Nina Haab, I'm the co-host, and now that we've set the stage for a panel discussion, it is time to introduce our speakers. Um, firstly, I'm pleased to announce Levo Hang Peko. If you want to quickly show yourself again. Welcome. So, Ms. Peko is a senior research fellow and political economist at a think tank called Trade Collective and has over 25 years of experience in cross-sector leadership. She is respected as an activist, scholar, public intellectual, political economist, international movement builder, and decolonial Africanist feminist theoretician. She is also a founding fellow of the African Futures Lab and one of the founding members of the Wellbeing Lab Africa. Among her areas of research, Specializations include international trade and international economics in the context of South-North relations, political economy, and international relations in relation to African positionality, to only name a few. Uh, she has been developing feminist well-being economics uh, ideation with the majority world uh, perspective and reparative economics over the past few years. Welcome, Ms. Peko. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm also excited to welcome Dr. Forrest Christoph Hoffmann, a member of the German Parliament and a member of the FDP in Germany. Hello to everyone. Yeah, welcome and thank you for being with us. Uh, Dr. Forrest Christoph Hoffmann has been a member of the German Bundestag since 2017. He was elected acting chairman of the Committee on Economic Cooperation and Development in January 2022. Additionally, Dr. Hoffman serves on the Committee on Food and Agriculture as a substitute member as well as in the Franco-German Parliamentary Assembly. Dr. Hoffman is a board member of the Parliamentary Group on Central Africa and a member of the Parliamentary Group on West Africa. He represents the FDP Parliamentary Group in the German Bundestag as a permanent representative to Vert Hunger Hilfe. 
Dr. Hoffman also sits on the board of the German Africa Foundation and Help EV. After studying forestry and obtaining his doctorate, Dr. Hoffman worked for the German Agency for Technical Cooperation, today GIZ, in Côte d'Ivoire, among other places. Before his election into the German Bundestag, he had been mayor of Bad Billingen in baden württemberg for 10 years. Once more, welcome. Furthermore, I'm thrilled that Christina Ackenberg is joining us today. She is a young professional in the field of international cooperation and currently pursuing her doctorate in intellect intercultural communication. Since 2021, she is serving as co-chair of the Board for Fairtrade Deutschland, a non-profit certification and civil society organization promoting for fair trading practices, uh, climate and environmental justice, and the improvement of livelihoods of farmers and workers worldwide. As Gold Scout, she has been actively engaged in youth cooperation and global partnership for more than a decade. She is focusing on urgent action for the advancement of gender equal access, participation and leadership with a particular interest on the nexus of gender, climate and trade justice, as well as the discourse on feminist development cooperation. Welcome, Ms. Ackenberg. So uh, we have seen Oh, yeah, I'm going to wait a second. Okay, Ms. Ackenberg, we unfortunately very cannot pleased, see you. I'm very pleased to join you and I will be there in a minute. Sorry. <laughs> no worries at all. So uh, I'm going to just continue then, uh, if you don't mind. So we have seen in our introduction why feminist trade policy is a prerequisite for fair global trade. And we are now excited to hear about the big, biggest challenges this, that arise to implementing it in Germany and the EU, as well as in the global south from each panelist's unique perspective. So we're now going to ask each panelist to, um, to present us each a statement and I am going to start with you, Ms. Peko, and I'm going to ask you, um, could you tell us where you see the biggest challenges to successfully implement feminist trade policies in the Global South? So thanks so much for the question and thanks for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be with all of us to co-create this conversation. The several problems that I can predict or that I can perhaps assess, and the one is that delinking from mainstream economics and trying to chart an alternative path um, or a more heterodox path really means that we need to think through a complete delinking with um, the, the, you know, the notion of um, knowledge economies, a decolonizing process of the current economic frameworks. And it's also a process that could result potentially in the adoption and implementation of autonomous policies and projects. And this means also recognizing that each country, each region has its own autonomy, has its own right to sovereignty. And one of the concerns and one of the critiques that many um, majority world scholars and activists like myself have is that in trying to implement new things the global north or you know european countries or the us often do so in a silo um and i think the other piece of this is that there's such a proliferation of distorted understandings of how trade policies work of the history of those trade policies of the inequities and toxicities of those as well um, and that oftentimes when we hear the words inclusive for example or expansive it makes the assumption that the worldview is is a european or eurocentric worldview um, and that what is being included is almost an extra an addendum to a, a template or framework that has already been set in Brussels or in Geneva or in New York, for example. And lastly, that that these approaches then seem to enjoy an, an unfettered cap capability to frame economic relations, create language, monopolize power, and often punish non-compliant majority world countries. And, and, and this can't really be, it's difficult to avoid this reality, this harsh reality and how it manifests in things like regime change, for example, um, engineered instability and so forth. So I think the final takeout from that for me would be that it's, you know, the challenge would be to examine and center 
um, the, you know, any new and ongoing uh, economic policy framing using the most dispossessed, the most marginalized, um, the most excluded, using a feminist decolonial framing to problematize the status quo and to ultimately think of a completely um, revolutionary and revolutionized uh, distributive power, privilege, and resource matrix. I'll leave it there for now. Thank you very much. Um, so my next question, or the next statement, we're going to hear from Mr. Hoffman. So Mr. Hoffman, could you tell us what challenges come to your mind when thinking about feminist trade between Germany and the Global South? Yeah, <clears throat> well, thank you very much uh, for, um, for this panel and for this discussion. I think it's uh, quite helpful to discuss this question. And of course, there is a lot of, um, as you mentioned in, uh, in, 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 the, in the video in the beginning, um, a lot of perspectives where women are um, marginalized or um, hindered in to, for their own, their own development. But we have to really to make a difference. The one thing is trade within a country. Then you have trade within, with, with other countries. Then you have trade with Germany. Then you have trade with Europe. And then you have women rights within their countries. And this, these results are very different in different countries. So let's say, for instance, in Northern Africa, women cannot own, own land. So if you can't own land, you can't make a farm. So this is, but this is internal, this is their rights. And it would be wrong if European countries would say, okay, we don't trade with North Africa anymore if you don't change this because it has to come out of their own society to give those women the right to own land. I think, so this is just an example. I just came back from the Congo last week and I've, uh, I had a meeting with the Ministry of Environment, a very strong lady in the driver's seat. And she was saying, what we need is more trade. We need more trade, we need more investment. And if you look at it, the trade of Germany with Africa is about 2%. This is nothing. So actually, I think we should step forward and have more trade in the beginning because everybody, when there's more trade, everyone, the whole society will sort of profit or have profits of it. We have seen during the Corona times when the global <clears throat> the globalization was shut off, how women suffered in like, let's say Bangladesh or Myanmar where the garment, there was no more garment trade, it was gone. So it's, it's really difficult and we have to look at each country. And I would be, and, and, and this lady like uh, in, in Congo, when, when we talked, she said, um, we need these investments now. We need electricity. And this gives us more opportunities for everyone. And also, for, and of course, it gives more rights for, for women. And of course we, we can, have in trade saying we don't trade with you if the pay gap is between women and men is too high but look at us in germany we still have the pay gap and i i wouldn't go out with a uh, sort of a, a moral statement saying the others have to do better than we do this is dangerous we shouldn't do that so i think that the basic get, get let's get to the basics more trade more investment helps everyone and then society will develop we have developed as well within our wealth. And we did, we, Germany is not the same like it was in the 50s. So we have changed as well because we were wealthy and we had time to think about these things. And uh, so I think this is the basic message for the global South. Let's get into investment, let's get into trade and much more than we did in the past. Thank you very much, Dr. Hoffman. And now I'm going to come to Ms. Ackenberg. Ms. Ackenberg, could you tell us about the challenges that come up when bringing together feminist uh, trade or feminism and um, fair trade? Where do you see the challenges in terms of collaboration between North and South? Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for this discussion and our exchange uh, this evening. I think we focus more on solutions uh, within the fair trade movement because we have a vast experience and expertise that comes together to work 
for bettering trade and I just came back from Brussels and I happened to witness uh, the adoption of the EP report on corporate sustainability due diligence. So I see that with several decades into the fair trade movement, we see milestones passing towards a more equitable supply chain management and trade policies that actually provide. We miss, must not miss chance to advocate for more for stronger, for more feminist, for more inclusive, more, for more equitable trade policies. And that, for, first and foremost, for me, means to recognize the intersectional nature of inequalities and of persisting inequalities. Fair trade, you see uh, our fair trade logo next to me, does deliver a certain blueprint, a blueprint of standards and of way of we cooperate with partners worldwide. And I would like to put forward the notion that we also might deliver a good best practice on how trade policies can be formed uh, on feminist values and basis. We put marginalized and discriminated people first, producers and farmers first. And I think especially women, young women are disproportionately affected by trade policies. I very much agree with, with, my, uh, with the two other speakers. First and foremost with the FECO that we need a revolution and it's time to revolutionize trade. And also we need probably more trade, but a certain kind of trade, the fair trade that actually delivers for all. More is not always better. More does not always and automatically deliver for all. And I'm very much looking forward to discuss the ins and outs. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now that we heard about the challenges, we wonder which areas in society actually need to be tackled most urgently to create sustainable change. And for this, now we're coming back to the Mentimeter that the audience did a little earlier. And I will ask Jana now to share the screen. Okay. So I'm going to take a second to take it in. We see care work, we see clothing, global supply chains women-led enterprises. And so for our next question, I'm going to pick one of the topics for each of our speakers. And um, maybe we can hear some input on that. So my first question about care work is going to go to Ms. Peko. Do you think that care work is already represented in current trade systems? And if not, how can we change that? Great question, one of my favorite questions actually. So if we think around care work and how we define work. So the, the very fact that we call it care work already minimizes it, I think. And for many years of myself in community with other um, feminist academics and feminist activists and feminist economists have been talking about this so this matrix between social work production and um and 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 labor reproduction and as well so if we look at market reproduction and social reproduction often known as care work as being actually symbiotic it really reorientates us away from the notion that care work is this fl fluffy thing that women do right it takes us away from this notion that taking care of children, looking after household, commuting to and from work, for example, the time that it takes to reproduce and to care for the rest of the, you know, the rest of the community and the society is somehow, um, you know, a, a gift that, labor, you know, a gift of labor that women give endlessly to the, you know, to, to capital economies, right, to market economies. And yet we understand that without these things that are supposedly so soft, and of course they're not soft, they're damn hard and they're very necessary, necessary nothing else happens, nothing else works. And of course, this, and, and there has been quite a lot of data that's been generated over the last few years around the kind of um, contribution that social reproduction makes potentially aggregate uh, to the aggregate of GDP, which have critiques of GDP, but it, you know it, the, the contribution that is being made and what is what is being measured. So I think if we think around social reproduction as being the apex. Of, um, of the economy, not just an addendum. It reorientates us completely. It revalues it. 
it revisibilizes it. It also makes sure, it also then gives us the language to then understand that we can have different conversations around this contribution, how it can be costed, how it can be recognized, how it can be potentially be, be remunerated and not only financially, but also in prestige, in power, in recognition and so forth. And lastly, to say that of course, care work as a nexus between that and the fact that there's a connection between um, the black and brown women who are migrating across the world to, to care for, um, to do care and social reproduction in other countries, of course, um, as in the hospitality sector, um, caring for other people's children in the in 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 medical care services across the world, 150,000 nurses from South Africa currently outside the country at a time when our own public health service is in a state of some crisis. We can see that the care, uh, migration, and economic nexus are closely linked together. Thanks. Thank you very much for that great answer. Um, my next question I am going to direct to Dr. Hoffman, because the next word I see kind of uh, prominently in our word cloud is women-led enterprises. So how can policies incorporate the need for supporting women-led enterprises in the framework of a feminist trade, of feminist trade policies? Yeah, this is a very nice question. Thank you for that. And um, I think um, German um, development politics has addressed these things uh, by the feminist um, development policy. Uh, we are sponsoring or what do you say or encouraging um, these kind of uh, women enter led enterprises in a lot of areas. So this is something where we could really make an input and tell them um, or tell others um, it is possible and uh, to give the self-esteem, to uh, encourage them, try to build up uh, financial systems so they can take part in the business, uh, so they can get micro and, so, and these kinds of things. So I think this is uh, quite um, well addressed. And, but, but then again, you have to look at the society where these, where these women live. Uh, whether they are, they can really come up with their own enterprises and be successful or not. I just met a woman in, in Mali. She just bought a gold mine. So there is good examples. And uh, sometimes uh, in Africa, I see examples. Uh, I, I wish we would have those in Germany, having this entrepreneurial spirit and also the courage um, to start these kind of enterprises, which is not easy. And uh, we are in development policy. We have a lot of startup centers um, where we sponsor or we are co-sponsors. And these startup centers um, create possibilities for women, for new ideas. And without uh, and getting out of this startup center, then they're starting their own business um, quite successfully. So we, we see a lot of uh, kind of these things. And, and um, so I think this is something which could really be addressed. It has not so much to do with trade, whereas the encouragement within the society. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to right away come to my last question, which I'm going to focus on global supply chains and also clothing. As I see, these are um, two very related topics and uh, can maybe also be addressed very well in a frame of uh, global fair trade. So Ms. Akenberg, um, do you think it is actually realistic to, in the next couple of years, tackle the yeah, big impact that the clothing industry has also in, in women lives and in, in female <laughs> lives um, in regard also of global supply chains? So what I want to ask, um, yeah, do you think it's realistic to tackle the issues that come with this um, highly feminized sector? Thank you so much. I generally like to be an optimistic and hopeful person. And we are advocating for change in the garment sector for years. So this has been a focus area. And there has been so many focus set due to the disasters, especially the disaster of Rana Plaza in recent years that readdressed the challenges and made them more public and made consumers 
worldwide more aware of the severe consequences that unsecure, dangerous, insufficiently monitored uh, working conditions have. And I feel like this is one of the sectors, you mentioned that I'm a Girl Scout, actually the global supply chain for garment and clothing is the one that most children learn the first about fair trade and global trade uh, lines, because it's the most, the one that is closest to our bodies every day. And that should be closest um, to our hearts and interests in global trade. And it's easy to understand where everything we wear, everything we choose to wear, everything we choose to buy comes from if you want to make an effort and monitor that supply chain. Um, so, yes, I agree, highly feminized uh, sector, but I think we are on the move towards more human rights due diligence in that sector. Also, thanks to, to many advocates um, who who rose the attention um, on that particular factor. Wonderful. Um, so now I thank you very much to, of course, our speakers and also to the audience for your input. And um, I will now actually pass on to Aaron to lead us through the next section. Yes, indeed. What I hear in the room so far is how important trade is in global relationships. And so far, I've heard uh, what I could hear from the room, would like to elaborate really and look at the basic challenges currently in the trade system that actually deny women and marginalized groups the rights, representation, and resources in the current trade system. And with that, I'd like to start with Ms. Peko. Uh, you mentioned, well, the issue of silent, uh, silo thinking and a distorted understanding based on like more of a Eurocentric viewpoint. And in your opinion, how are women in the global South currently being disadvantaged by the trade system? Yeah, another fantastic one. Thank you so much, um, Brother Aaron, for that one. So where does one begin? I mean, we, 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 we appreciate that trade liberalization produces different results for women and men. We also appreciate that these um, these results are also the aspects of you know deal with livelihoods of well being, including food security, food sovereignty, um, employment, income, access to affordable health services, and so forth. Um, and that it's 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 it the, 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 this traverses various sectors um, and subsectors of trade liberalization, agriculture, services, clothing, textiles, and intellectual property. I do want us to be careful not to fetishize the condition of African women as though. Um, and to frame it in the, in the to frame it as victimhood, it is really the result of structural violence, um, structural inequity, and the structure um, of uh, of how international trade architecture has been constructed. Um, the way that it has, you know, international economic architecture is really presented is all is, is, is you know is is designed to is is really designed to pivot in the favor of Euro US. Um, and to some extent, um, you know, one could add Japan, China now, um, Australian interests and so forth, so-called coordinations at the WTO. So I do I do want us to be mindful not to fetishize and victimize, you know, this idea of the the vict of the victims, the victimhood of African women and so forth. That's really important. Um, but I do think that when we speak around the logic of free trade uh, of, of free trade it does have particular impacts so one of the impacts is then is is on you know for example where we see that there's a truncation in the way states are able to to to, to manage their own resources one of the things around free trade or so if if we should even be calling it free trade and i'll say a bit more about that now is it free trade or is it managed trade because free trade then does seem to suggest that this is an egalitarian, democratized system, right? It's it's free to it's free to all. Um, all have equal access to it, have equal power within it, and are able to equally influence it. And this doesn't seem to be the case. This really means seems you know I would suggest that perhaps we call it trade management, and that this trade management is steeped in particular power and social relations, which I mentioned at the outset. But that this means that. The, the 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 chasm between the most dispossessed, um, you know, and and between those who are able to access this free market, um, are, 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 are really mediated by you know race, class, uh, gender, 
um, and so forth, ableism and, and other intersectional um, components of this. Another piece is that we have to appreciate that the power and the and and of, of competition of competition in this free trade matrix mean that several things happen: the flooding of cheaper goods um, and on 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 African on African economies, especially in the agricultural sector, where women are are predominant. Right? Um, we are responsible for seventy percent of agriculture. The dumping of goods um, of free of cheap European and and U.S. goods. I mean, the we're still fighting over with over U.S. chicken to this day, right, the Agoa um, is one example of this. The second is, the, is, is that, um, for example, capital controls on direct investment. So this means, for example, that free markets suggest that there's going to be a liberal capital movement uh, and that this is more efficient while restrictions discourage investment. Now, the primary concern of free market is still that investors can go to countries with fewer controls. Where there are fewer controls, it also means there are often fewer labor controls, fewer environmental controls. What does this mean? It means that women are often pushed into the most, the, the, the most devaluing end of the value chain, the, the, the lowest paid, most unprotected, least prestigious, um, most dangerous, most hazardous in many cases, forms of work. So there is that. The other piece of this is that when we think around free trade and intellectual property, for example, um, and, and how intellectual property is not only that which is written, but that which is carried. And many people and many women in particular carry this knowledge of seeds, of, um, of, of the way climate works, for example, of threading processes, of very complex agricultural processes, of fertilizer and so forth, with the advent of agri of of agri of agri businesses and these huge agri you know very very um, aggressive agricultural cartels like your Monsantos, your Del Montes, and so forth. This has completely displaced and upended the capacity to be the holders of this knowledge, um, and of course to also be the purveyors of food, not only food security. But food sovereignty, um, the advent of GMOs, uh, genetically modified organisms, and so forth. And I think that the other piece of this is that when we also think around uh, the sectors where women uh, particularly are, um, are most vigorous and are most robust. So South Africa, for example, our manufacturing sector, the leather sector, the fruit canning sector, took a complete beating post-1994 particularly after we signed on to some of the WTO agreements, which liberalized those markets that liberalized those sectors and opened them up to international competitions. Again, um, sectors where women were primarily the you know the largest employ um, employed there, um, they immediately were decimated. So I think if we're not able to think around the protection of, um, of, of sectors where women are, it's going to be very problematic, but also the structural issues. So where we see, for example, the structural concerns that I have around capital flows, um, um, austerity, for example, and the ways that the, the way that the free trade, uh, the, the free trade um, dogma suggests that the state needs to have a less a, a less visible a, a less visible role to play in economics. Right, the state shouldn't be the state. The state should just stand around. Um, you know, stand around with a drink, sipping a drink or whatever, and allow capital and markets and the private sector to run things. What this does is also means that the commodification of healthcare, of education, of transport services and so forth, which means, go back to your initial, the initial question, that the social reproductive or the care economy, the care, the, the, the care work and the, the, the work that should be, that is the that, that resides in the care economy is again passed on to women, right? Um, so I think that there are many multiple reasons that I think that you know where that women are particularly hampered by by so-called free trade agreements and the and, and the international trade um I guess rhetoric. Thanks. <clears throat> Yeah, Dr. Frost Christman, I would like to gather from what uh, and uh, get you to this question. You mentioned earlier that the trade Germany has with the African continent is just about 2%. And uh, with what we just heard about the challenges women face in terms of intersectional, it's not just a change because they are women, but the intersectionality of it, and at the level of World Trade Organization that also decides in terms of that sort of regulates trade multilateral trade relations. So 
the question I would like to pose to you is, what is the range of action that Germany has at the European level to channel trade policies that avoids the that avoids a more in, uh, increase in the inequity that the inequality that women in the global south face in the current trade systems? Uh, you're still muted, please, Dr. Foss. Sorry about that. Thank you for this question. Um, foreign trade is uh, the European Union is in charge of that. Uh, Germany is not in charge of that. So this is the European Union. And uh, we have the German supply chain law, which is not really working when Europe doesn't have one. So we should have a European one. This is, has always been our position. And um, we can, you, can, you can do several things with such a law. But there is limits to it as well, because there are other players on the, in the global market. And for all the precious metals, you always find another buyer. So if bureaucracy is too high, people will just use other, uh, other channel to sell things. And when you look at, um, um, for instance, um, um, at the buying power of Europe in general, it used to be like Europe could have set the standards easily because buying power in Europe is very high together with the US. Now, all this buying power is shifting towards India, China, uh, and the Pacific countries, Indonesia. So it's not easy to set these standards anymore as it used to be. So this is kind of difficulty we're going to face in the near future because it's always someone else who's going to buy the stuff. So. This is one thing. And I'll give you two examples. Um, when I was working in Ivory Coast 25 years ago, the, 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 the agricultural market was flooded with European uh, chicken meat. So farmers couldn't do any chickens anymore because they couldn't get any, any, any profits from it because the market was flooded with these. Uh, then the government decided um, to have a, a tax on import of chicken meat. So then it worked out, and nowadays Ivory Coast is the exporter of chicken meat. So these things have worked and have given uh, given the people in the country the opportunity for a new business. And now you see in Ivory Coast today that eighty percent of the fish is being imported from China. This is was a, it was very surprising to me, but it was important. Eighty percent of the fish in Ivory Coast is imported from China. Also, they have a vast um, um, river uh, and a lot of rivers in the country, a lot of lakes in the country, and they have a long coastline. They could be self-sufficient with fish supply anyway. So, but there is a problem with the trade. As you can see, when 80% of the fish is imported, there's something wrong. And, but it's up to the governments to decide how they can tackle these problems. And uh, you cannot everything uh, manage out of Brussels. I think this is a, not an not a idea which will work. I like the free, um, the fair trade uh, thing that people, consumers can decide as well. And consumers have to be sensitive to what they buy in a, in a European context. And I think the times where Europe just tells other governments what they can do and what they can't and how trade has to work and not, I think this is very limited now because the world has changed. And um, so I, I leave it for an hour because otherwise it would, I would be too long. Uh, uh, Ms. Akenbeck, the next question goes to you. And do you think fair trade as a mark and fair trade Germany can help to reduce gender inequalities in the supply chains or at best improve the working conditions for women in this uh, supply chains? I must definitely do. Thank you very much. The participation, the economic participation, the social participation, the political participation of women is hard and center for fair trade. And not only for fair trade Germany, for the international fair trade system that involves producers and farmers, that produces workers along the supply chain, that includes um, anyone up to the female CEO of Fair Trade International. The question is, how do we ensure that leadership, empowerment, engagement, representation 
is distributed throughout the whole um, fair trade system and along and across global supply and value change. And I think we have several very concrete models from leadership academies to mentoring programs, but also very concrete demands when it comes to how the political environment should be shaped. We are discussing land rights and access to resources. We are discussing access to funding from seed funding to microcredits. We are discussing and debating the best um, uh, standards to introduce living wages and living income for producing uh, communities. And we are addressing uh, labor rights. We, we already talked about the garment clothing sector, um, which is one of the most harmful ones. And beyond that, any processing that involves uh, female workers shows that those are particularly disenfranchised and affected by malpractice. And the movement is aiming to be led in a gender equal, gender transformative way. And I think we are doing this every day and in trying to, to gain more practice um, every day. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. And I'd like to follow up on what you mentioned earlier about your part, your visit, I think you mentioned last week at Brussels and on the issue of due diligence. So with this, uh, how can fair trade help to champion policies that actually put this international trading company such as Monsanto and Bayer that are actually also involved in these sectors where women are mostly affected to actually ensure that the women, it's not just an add on pers perspective to say we follow due diligence, but it's actually implemented. Thank you. Um, I think emphasizing the add on nature is very critical. Women's rights, gender equality should never end up in an amendment, should never end up on the last page of any agreement uh, or communique or treaties. And it often still does because it's, because it's not put right and center. We see when it comes to EU legislation that from deforestation to sustainable reporting, we have several new features that come along with the European Green New Deal, but also alongside it that introduce sustainability measures that address women directly by word and also hopefully in practice. Now, right now, we are at the stage where we're still advocating for ever more stronger, more inclusive policies on that. And I think when we're discussing how Germany can contribute, Germany must now follow through with any commitments made in strategy papers when it comes to the negotiations between the EU institutions. And even beyond that, we see with the UN guiding principles on business rights, um, business and human rights, um, that first and initial steps have been undertaken, significant progress have been made. Now, the next step would be, for example, uh, WTO um, regulation. And whenever we are addressing a new issue, a new field, a reform, a revolution, if I may, Women and gender equality must be part of the core principles and leading and guiding values. Yes, uh, thank you. And uh, with that, I would like to hand on to Nina. Let's go on to a second topic where we'll try to look at more looking at perspectively towards solutions in implementing a feminist trade policy that actually strives to meet fair north-south trade. Great. Thank you, Aaron. So we have already heard that decolonizing current economic processes is one of the major challenges, as well as to actually increase trade and also increase investments. We also heard that actually quality should maybe go over quantity. In terms of scope of actions, we heard that managing their own re or <laughs> own resources, so that women should manage their own resources, that would be one scope of action. Also, we heard that free trade is kind of a sensitive and also critical topic, highly controversial. And further scope of actions actually could be um, uh, seen on a European level, especially in terms of supply chains. So. Now that we heard all that, the question is, what can we learn from the problems 
and how can they be avoided or solved so that we can strive together towards a fair global feminist trade. I'm going to direct my first question to Ms. Akenberg. So for a little bit of context, the existing German feminist foreign and development policies have both been criticized for allegedly reproducing neo-colonial continuities. They also said to disregard the diversity of cultural contexts in the global south and that norms are paternalistically imposed from the global north. How can one avoid Euro-Western approaches, especially with regards to power relations in the implementation of uh, German feminist trade policy? And how can we actively work against colonial continuities? Thank you. I th think the key word is co-creation. Both strategies tried to invite voices of civil societies, voices of the people affected, voices and representatives of MAPA, those who are addressed in those strategies. Within the fair trade movement, we, our discussion and debate are led by the communities within the global south, who teach the global north about their needs, about their expectations, about their demands. And I think this is something that we should try to reproduce when it comes to feminist fair trade in general. This is a blueprint, this is a best practice uh, from our perspective. I see challenges, uh, especially when it comes to who should be addressed uh, in strategizing for new trade policies, who sh whose voices should be heard. For us, a civil society movement, civil society organizations always come first, but I understand that this might be a challenge in formulating policies um, between heads and states of government. Yet, <laughs> um, again, both strategies lay a good foundation and groundwork. I would like to stress and highlight that any policy needs more coordination and coherence and needs stream to be streamlined, to be mainstreamed across sectors. If there is something like a feminist trade policy um, to be developed and strategized further, this exercise should not be led by one ministry alone. I see those two strategies that have already been presented as siloed action. Siloed action that at some points do speak to each other, but may not offer open doors for all other ministries to come in and join the effort. And I think especially on trade, which touches among so many different portfolios, and this should be the main exercise for the German government to take an actual leading position. Ms. Peko, do you consider Ms. Ackenberg's suggestion sufficient? I think Ms. Ackenberg's um, suggestions are, are helpful. Their points are forward. I do think, however, that if we are to really reframe and to reconstitute the way in which trade takes place. I, I, I would like to go back to my initial comment, which is that the default can't be the that there's a template that's been set in Brussels or in um, Geneva or in Washington or wherever, and that this is then presented to the global south almost as a fait accompli and that we need to kind of figure out, configure our way around it. And I, I think that the questions of multipolarity are very important that policy sovereignty is very important especially because the world today is not the world that it was in you know 50 60 70 years ago fortunately we are we are looking at uh, the context of where there are multiple um poles of power the BRICS are now also emerging as we're aware of a, as a as a as a, as a, a quite formidable pole of power um representing 40 percent of global trade in fact um and there are conversations that are taking place around potential de-dollarization and i think that those those conversations have taken have gone far beyond urban legend um, and sort of some kind of a fantasy, uh, but there seem to be already between, for example, India and China, the uh, arrangements around, for example, trading in rupees or in, in yuans and so forth. So this is, these are not fairy tales anymore, right? Um, and I think that that kind of sovereignty is one that needs to take place and and free as, as again i'd like to go back to the definitional dilemma that i have that if it's really free then it really needs to be if it were really free 
in the way that's democratized and egalitarian, we wouldn't even be having this conversation. And there's also no getting away from the fact that the terms of engagement, they have a toxic history. Um, and, and until and unless we're willing to dismantle and confront, well, those who set the terms, un unless and until they are willing, and I, 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 all, 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 in this context, respectfully, fingers are pointing towards Europe and the U.S. in particular. Um, until they are willing to dismantle and to rethink and to reflect on that, I'm not sure whether we're going to be able to have conversations that are really authentic. Uh, we're going to keep on picking away at processes and reconstructing more of the same. We used to call it structural adjustment, and then we called it P PRSPs, globalization, and now it's free trade. But it, it, it comes down to very extractive neoliberal capitalist practices, which are steeped in colonial power relations. So I'm not really sure whether there's much to redeem, but I think as a, as a, as a, as an entry point, indeed, I hope that we can perhaps at least begin to explore much more egalitarian trade making, meaning making, and policy co creation. Uh, thank you very much. And I'd like to jump in exactly with the statement you mentioned. I mean, you said there's already a template. And my question would be who actually needs to get on board? in the elaboration of such a trade policy from the global south to ensure that it's not just something that comes from here and comes down and say, oh, we taught this new term, we taught this new thing, and you should implement it. But which actors from the global south can one invite to the table and say, we want to rethink this and see that we actually get to something which is fair, like eye to eye and not one-sided? Would that be to me, Aaron? Yes, please. Thank you. So you see the the framing of your question um, again <laughs> presents me with more questions. So you say invite to the table. Who has already so the, the table is set, it's built. Um, who has decided that it's a table? Maybe I want to sit on a futon, maybe I want to sit on a beanbag. You know, so the all these the terms of engagement are already set. Um who is to say that it's for them, it's for Europe to invite? Maybe it's us, it's for us to invite folks from Berlin, um, Brussels, Paris, London, New York, come to Johannesburg on our terms, come to Nairobi on our terms, come to Lagos on our terms, come to Maseru on our terms. So the framing of your question for me, um, respectfully, Aaron, takes us back to the same dilemma. And I would agree with you, shamefully so. We are in a position where we are starting from a status quo and we are trying to invent the wheel. So it's, I agree with you totally. I mean, I would also go with you and say, well, if we still insist that the global South needs to be invited on the table, then we are starting already from, we are not starting from scratch, but we are starting with the script. And it's already this position of power dynamics. And uh, from there, I'd like to go on to Dr. Foss, uh, Christoph, and ask, how do you see what Ms. Peko mentioned, where she says she'll probably not like to sit on a round table, and who determines who actually gets to this table? Sorry, your mic is still muted. Yeah, I, I think it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's not a very good idea, it's a necessity. Uh, that African leaders are sitting on the table when we're talking about trade. And um, as like the German supply chain law was done without African voices, absolutely zero. And as we talked, like uh, I talked to uh, South um, Eastern East African ambassadors, they were saying, you did help us in our fight against corruption with that law. This was something that the Europeans didn't think of at that point. If they would have been at the table with the African, that point had, could have been addressed in that law. So you see, this is just an example where both sides could uh, profit from each other. And um, but I have to come back a little. I think the freight, the global free trade, is a good thing. It is always framed like a bad thing. No, it's a good thing. The development of the SDGs, we have been on a good, good way before COVID, and that was due to free trade, global free trade. Of course, there is always something which could have been done better, definitely. 
It, and but it, overall, if you sum it up, we had less hunger, we had less problems with health and everything was on a good path. And so we had, we, we cannot go back and say uh, we'll stop this kind of trade. And um, I think there's always a good and a bad. So of course, if you liberalize everything and you have don't, don't have any framework at all, um, things go haywire. That's that's for clear. That's 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 okay. But you mentioned Bayer. You mentioned Montesano. These companies are huge companies. They're powerful companies. I agree. But they have the good things on their side as well. They have done a lot of inventions which are really good for mankind. Don't forget that. So it's, you know, I, I don't like this framing of saying this is a bad company. Oh, we have to block them and somehow. Of course, they have done good inventions and they have feeding, you know, they have been feeding the world on one, on one hand. They have been had very good progress on uh, plant materials and so forth. So we have to work together and we do, I, I don't like this framing in bad and good and then we have to fight these, la la la, and this one. I think we have to have a, a common progress. And regarding the feminist um, trade, don't forget the family business. I mean, family business is something where the whole family works together. And Germany is an ex excellent example of family business. Our economic backbone is family business. I mean, these big companies like Steel or Bosch or whatever that they have developed over the years. But family business is very important. And it's like small scale farmers in Africa usually is family business. It's not women or men's business, it's family business. Don't forget that. I'm going to jump in again. So now you've been highly advocating for free trade. However, I was wondering, like, how are you going to consider actual decolonial perspectives within that free, free trade? Are you addressing this question to me? Yes, I, yeah. Well, I, I don't think, in, I don't, I think it's not very useful to think in these kind of categories. It's nice to, to go on a, a green parliament convention and say neo-colonization, everybody will cheer. But it, you have to face the reality. People in Africa, they want food, they want health system, they want income, the government wants tax to pay a hospital and so forth. So this is the basic thing. And, and this kind of academic fine tuning we're doing in Berlin and Berlin bubble, I don't think it's very, very uh, the bottom line. And we're doing a lot of things in, in, in the economic cooperation development towards to promote women. And if I would start a business in Africa, I would only do it with women because I know they are more reliable. And I, I know they would be um, the, the ones to uh, and pay back the credits and all that. So, I mean, there's so many options and I don't think we will, it will lead very far if we stay in kind of framings and uh, not looking at the reality. And yeah, there's limits, like I said, Northern Africa. That you have a uh, Islamic faith of a high percentage of the population. And if you start criticizing their religion, you're interfering internally heavily. And this is something we shouldn't do. Yes, I would agree with you, Dr. Forst Christoph, and I think maybe uh, it's on my part a misunderstanding in the framing. I think we are not criticizing Monsanto or Bayer that they are doing something, but they are doing really very good innovations. However, what we notice is that this innovation leads to dependencies that affects or renders the food sovereignty on food, uh, like the access to food on a sustainable level for the global south and mostly for women more fragile and so the question is actually to look at how to do it differently that makes it less fragile for these women on the long term and i would like to turn to miss uh, arkenberg uh, how do you see the aspect of free trade and the representation of women in this free trade does free trade increases the uh, representation as well as access to resources for women. I think we should never assume that more trade or more free trade, more trade liberalization does 
automatically lead to more representation, more empowerment, more representation, more co-responsibility co and, and shared um, values. There is no automatic um, mechanism behind that. The, what, the question is how do we frame it from the very beginning with the starting point in negotiations and throughout implementation. Um, so yes and no, and the big question is how do we achieve that? I think the, the biggest challenge now is to mainstream a human rights-based approach in any new, for example, um, regional free trade agreement that is set or in negotiations, and whether we can manage to bind the way we pursue trade, um, even if it's just on regional basis or within uh, preferred free trade areas, and whether we, we are able to bind it back to the guiding principles that most governments uh, already uh, co-signed or declared um, their accordance with. Um, I think that, again, uh, the fair trade model might promote a blueprint, and we should look beyond that and seek a more gender transformative agenda. I'm going to slightly change the topic because now I also want to shed some light on intersectional perspectives. So just for the audience, because maybe not everyone actually um, knows so much about the term uh, intersectionality. The concept of intersectionality describes the ways in which systems of inequality based on gender, race, ethnicity, sexual orientation, etc., um, and other forms of discrimination intersect to create unique dynamics and effects. For example, when a Muslim woman is wearing a hijab, is being discriminated, and it would be impossible to dissociate her female from her Muslim identity and to isolate the, the dimensions causing her discrimination. And now I'm going to direct my uh, question to Mr. Hoffman. How can we include an intersectional perspective in designing a feminist trade policy? Of course, if you have trade agreements, um, this this question should be mentioned and this should be addressed in, in these uh, circumstances. But as I said, it, sometimes it's there is limits to it when you have, deal with a country where women have traditionally or by religion or the, like uh, in the Iran or something where it's extremely uh, to the religious uh, leadership. Um, there's limits to it. I mean, if you want to have trade with them or have, you don't have trade with them. So there's a, there's a line uh, and there's a, I mean, there is, I mean, you can always agree, you should always address it in agreement. And, but it's, 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 I mean, it's difficult. I mean, when you have a trade, a trade agreement with Canada, it shouldn't be a problem. When you have a trade agreement with Iran, you will have difficulties. So this is what I'm trying to say. Every city, every country is different, and every country has a has a sort of. And you can always like sort of try to um, um, to to progress a little to the limit. And this is with every trade agreement in every region would be difficult. It would be different. It's not the same. Like when you have a trade agreement with Canada, you can have hundred percent. And if you have a trade agreement with Iran, you will have the zero percent, and all the other countries that are in between. So, and you have, but I agree completely. You have to address this question, and uh, so that we can progress from there on. But you don't have to expect that tomorrow everything will be on European standards. Ms. Pico, would you like to comment on the intersectional intersectionality of feminist trade policy? See. Um, I can give it a go. Thank you. So, I mean, I think when we think about intersectionality, as you've rightly said, it takes into account, you know, historical, um, social, economic um, forms of political forms of oppression and where these intersect um, and where there's the concurrency of um, of oppression, of alienation, of dispossession, as you as you have mentioned. And I think it's important always to mention that, of course, the intersectional framework and matrix comes from Black feminist struggles, um, specifically from the US. And many of us in the majority world have leaned on that. And I do think it's important because it's, you know, the history of where it comes from is almost as important as the framing itself. Um, and I, I'm also wondering about the 
When we think about that, it then gives us the opportunity to understand and appreciate the power dynamics that take place um, in, and the structural and systemic power that is at play when we're thinking around, when, when we're dealing and grappling with international trade, um, fair or unfair, right? Uh, when we're dealing with the systemic and institutional power of formations like the World Trade Organization, um, like the World Bank, like the IMF, right? Which are and the, 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 the writing and the literature does support the view that they've been present, they've been, they've been formed in a way and they're propelled in a way that makes it systemically very difficult for um, majority world countries or um, low income countries, for example, to really access power and to access voice. And this notion that these are fair playing field, right? That this is a space and a place where the WTO, for example, which I've attended a few of their meetings on the sidelines, of course, not inside, not, not, not inside the green room or anything. But the way that power is transacted there suggests that obviously um, it's 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 very extractive, similar to their policy to the trade policies themselves, and very coercive oftentimes. It's not just trade, it's often deeply politicized, it's often laced with international relations and other forms of other concessions, right? Around climate. Um, around military provisions, for example, and it's trade, the trade, trade is not even just about trade, that's another problem. And when we then see that the power play is um, steeped in um, geographic, in particular social and political and economic geographies, it's also linked very much with the feminization of trade and the masculine, the masculine, the masculinization of trade and, and trade power, how particular things are prioritized and even framed, how gender, as Miss um, Miss Ackenberg has put, is somewhere on page page 301 out of a 300 page document, for example. It's hardly there, basically. Um, this is again the way in which we can see that intersectional power and intersectional. Inter, you know, of, of intersectional power has a strong and, and analysis extremely important. I've said in the past that I think that the you know world the World Trade Organization is basically created in, in the image of of a white man, um, you know, a white able bodied man um, who is you know heteronormative, who is sitting somewhere in a very cold climate, um, and and who clearly has no sense of the world and the space around them. That is exactly the problem. And that's, it's not enough to have Dr. Ngozi as the head of the WTO. And I think we shouldn't, let's not mistake um, symbols for substantive structural power. There's nothing that, there's very little that one single person as dynamic, as strong as she may be, can do in the, fun, in the, in the, in the face of a huge behemoth of power. And just as, as a final example, People, you know, some people have said, well, why don't the, the small nations or why don't, if you're not happy, why don't the African countries go and sue? Do you know how much it costs per hour to sue? Oftentimes we don't have the resources to sue. We don't have enough foot soldiers even to be able to, um, you know, to be able to, to, to manage the complexities of that, not because we're dumb or backwards, but because they are just, there's just too much going on. The US delegation arrives there with, you know, 50 lawyers, um, 500, you know, 50 engineers, several agriculturists, several agronomists, and so that's what a US delegation looks like. Whereas a country, and I don't want to, my country, Lesotho, for example, my country of origin, we arrived there maybe with five people trying to spread ourselves with, with between all of these discussions. How can we say that power is equally distributed in such a in such a in, in, in such a in such an institution? And this is just a, a a a microcosm of how power plays out globally. Therein you have the problem with the colonized, um, completely sexist, patriarchal way in which international trade plays itself out. Hence, an intersectional lens is necessary to see that this is not an even playing field. I want to come back to the um, question of masculinization of trade. And I'm gonna direct the question to you, Ms. Ackenberg. So the current status quo has men as decision makers and those getting higher benefits out of trades as compared to women. How does fair trade ensure that men are no longer favored as decision makers 
And is the selective improvement of working conditions and wages through fair trade certification sufficient to address deeper global injustices? Thank you. Um, starting from the beginning, starting from the lived reality in com producing communities, um, I would like to the, put the focus on leadership, mentoring, training, skill provision programs for women to, for example, succeed in advancing from labor and um, labor intensive jobs and uh, contributions from the agricultural sectors to move on uh, gain a certain skill set and uh, reach their full potential. Um, secondly, I think it's worth highlighting that uh, networks within the system uh, focus on gender parity when it comes to representation, and that promotes bringing um, women, uh, starting with young women, young youth ambassadors to the negotiation tables, maybe the, the COP negotiations um, or the General Assembly, and that opens up rooms and that opens up perspectives and give voices um, to, to young and to female uh, leaders uh, across the system. And thirdly, wherever there is um, an advocacy effort for fair trade, um, that means gender fair um, practices and standards, and that means women on the table. So this is something that is um, a lived experience, um, I hope so, for most. And uh, the gender strategy showed that we and recent efforts over the last um, five to 10 years um, actually promoted um, women in leadership roles and their capacities um, to further promote um, marginalized and vulnerable groups within um, the sector. I think the key issue is um, to bring up the most feminized, most vulnerable sectors within produ from producing um, to um, the yeah, other factories up to equal um, standards. And that meets, means gender equality in all positions um, along the system. Thank you. So we're coming slowly to an end of this section. However, I want to um, direct one last question to Dr. Hoffman, because we've already talked so much about trade liberalization. And um, whenever trade liberalization leads to national governments downsizing public sectors um, and public sector spending, women are disproportionately more affected by the increased demand for informal care service. Do you see opportunities to include reproductive and care work in feminist trade policies? And if yes, how? Well, this is very specific. I mean, um, as I said, if you have more trade and, and, and the GDP is rising, so on general, if it's good for the government, the government spending could be high, can be higher than it was. So for health system, social system, and these kind of things, you will have the money. I mean, um, you know, a workers' union doesn't make sense if you don't have a job, and if you don't, if there is no jobs at all. I mean, this is when you have a society, industrial society, and you have workers, then union makes a lot of sense and so forth. So it's it's a matter of where you start from. And um, uh, regarding uh, gender equality, you see a lot of countries in Africa, for instance, where you have a uh, gender equality in laws. And um, like in Rwanda, you have, I think you have more MPs, uh, female MPs than male MPs. I mean, there is, there is a countries uh, which have been made, making progress. And uh, just recently, the president of Kenya was in Berlin and it was asked, what do you think about the feminist uh, development policy or uh, foreign policy, the feminist foreign policy? And he says, for us, it's not a problem. Uh, we have a right. Every, every uh, woman can be a candidate for a party on a list and being elected to parliament. And usually women vote for women so it's such a natural process that they will have a rise in the members of parliament in Kenya. That was his, uh, his point of view. And uh, so I, I think it's just a very logic um, development as he mentioned it. And of course, there's a long way to go. And we have all, all these old customs and so forth. Um, but you, as I said, it goes step by step. And we have to keep on working on those steps. And, um, but we have to watch very carefully that you don't stop free trade because 
free trade just means nothing but you will have the goods you wanted at any time at the lowest price. And this is good for everyone in ending. And if you think about, for instance, Bangladesh, where you have the garment sector, look what Bangladesh was 20 years ago. What was the GDP? At what point on the uh, wealth ladder of the world they were and where they are now? This is a, a huge good example. And, and you can see the, for the, the, the rate of children born uh, went down in that country. Also, it's an Islamic country. And this is also um, an effect of the wealth they have been working on. And it was the women who really worked hard to bring in the wealth for Bangladesh. So there's good developments and good examples. And um, so, yeah, I think this is, this is why I'm still advocating free trade and more trade and more investment. And the only and thing we, we, should, we should be in Germany, we sh why don't we have the courage to take some risks for investment in LTD countries in Africa? The thing is, is, we're kind of missing the point of fair work provoking that I specifically asked hunger for. and poor. So, I mean, the question was meant in a way that care work is definitely a double burden, um, especially for women. And um, we already heard from Ms. Peko that, um, yeah, basically it's not a fluffy gift of labor and um, we should reevaluate care work. And I'm going to direct the question, basically the same question now to you, Ms. Peko. How would you incorporate care work in feminist trade policies? Thanks so much, Janina. Um, so yeah, I think as you rightly say, uh, well, as I said earlier, it's not sort of light and fluffy at all. Um, and which is why there's a growing school of thought that is really talking around how social reproduction and care work needs to be calibrated and counted into the GDP. Now, the other critiques that I have around the GDP, which I'll I'll talk about during the Q&A, but I do think that it's also very important to appreciate that the care matrix and the market reproductive matrix are symbiotic and they're always in relationship with each other. They run in tandem. Now, how can these also be um, integrated into the, into the market economy? Several ways. I mean, the one is, of course, by ensuring that they're subsidized, they're subsidized care facilities, right? Public health facilities, for one thing, um, school facilities, for another thing, stretch kindergarten, nursery school facilities as well, so that this is institutionalized and normalized um, and subsidized in, in terms of not having to pay a lot, large amounts of money. I'm not sure if, you, if, if most European countries are similar, but in South Africa, if one wants to access that kind of care as a working parent, you pay for it. I mean, my we, we paid for our, our, our children's, you know, after school care and preschool care and so forth. It isn't part of the state care matrix. And it should be. It should be like going to the dentist, getting an eye test, right? Um, the second thing is then this also means then we have to recalibrate other social um, social investments like transport, like, um, like city planning, like town planning, so that it's easy for people to drop children off, so that the matrix between, um, for example, going to work, the, 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 the time consumption of going to work, um, going to school, fetching children and so forth is narrowed quite significantly. So several feminist economists have written about the, the, the double and triple tax that people pay, that women pay in order to, to participate in the economy. Before we even get to work, there's the tax of time. There's the tax of childcare, parental care, other forms of tax that we pay. And then the tax that we pay at the end of the month or the week or whatever, multiple taxes in order to participate in the market economy, yeah? Um, which, which are not in any way calibrated, calculated and so forth. And as an example, it often, you know, for the for an average working class person in this country, it takes about one and a half to two hours to get to work. Some people wake up at four in the morning and start making their way to work by five in the morning. It might it might sound absolutely onerous and brutal because it is. It is. 
And all of this because many work you know, institutionally, structurally, systemically, and at organizational level, it has not yet been understood that the care matrix is essential to market economics. Thank you very much. That was a strong last statement. And um, I thank all of our three panelists for this exchange of opinions. And now I believe that the audience has um, yeah, a big amount of questions. And I will hand over to Konstantin now to present us the questions from the audience. Thank you. Uh, yes, first of all, a huge thank you from my side and from the background team to all our three panelists. Um, for the fruitful and very insightful um, discussion. We have a lot of questions actually that, that came along in the chat and we already had some, some discussions also starting there. Um, so if I could kindly, most kindly ask the three of you to keep your answers rather short so we can get to a few more questions uh, for each of you, that would be amazing. Um, starting with the first question to you, Ms. Arkenberg, which was I think the, the most highly voted question in the chat. Um, it's sort of a mixture of a, of a comment and then a question um, saying that you have to think about feminist and inclusive trade policy in today's world, always together with ecological issues and climate change. And also saying that more trade and more consumption cannot be the solution, but instead we should consume less and pay more fairly for the products. And now comes the question, how can we come to sustainable solutions in this regard? Over to you, Ms. Arkenberg. Thank you very much for this question. Um, actually, the debate when it comes to degrowth or even shrinking um, is very crucial for fair trade. Let's be frank, every chocolate bar you buy helps to produce the fair trade premium is licensing fees. That means that we can contribute back to producers and farmers. And that's why it's so important that if you choose to consume, you choose rightly and you approach it with a certain set of values that inform your decision and with a certain set of ingenuity and being curious about learning where the things you, you consume, you take for yourself, um, are produced and come from and which responsibility as a consumer you take on with the decision you make on an everyday life uh, basis. Um, so I think we are at the starting point of this uh, debate um, and I think it's crucial for the fair trade system now to invite voices of the global south on equal manner in this debate um, because of course uh, our farmers and producers they ask for more access and they asked to be able um, to bring their products to the consumers in the global now north yet is this um, in a long-term perspective um, sustainable we will have to find um, um, an equilibrium, quite um, a challenge. So whenever there's someone in the audience uh, that could help us um, solve this dilemma, please come forward. Because the idea once fair trade was perceived um, was, of course, to open up markets for fair trade labeled products. Um, and uh, I personally do totally agree. Um, more is not always um, better. Thank you for that question. And Thank you. Thank you so much for, for the answer. Um, second question, which was also um, upvoted by, by many uh, in the audience to you, um, Mr. Hoffman. Ms. Fico has mentioned that we currently have a managed trade system, which is kind of controlled by the Global North, rather than a free trade system. Question, would you agree on that perspective? And can you highlight some points on how to make the global trading system more free as your party is aiming for? The stage is yours. If, if, if you could unmute your mic. Thank you. Sorry, once again. Um, yeah, the, the global framework is, is made by the WTO, the World Trade Organization. So this is the framework. And there's always been, um, uh, there's always room for improvement uh, with the WTO. But the WTO is, a, is a difficult, uh, uh, it's difficult now because, as I said, buying power is shifting more into the Pacific area and region. And um, so the, the dominance of what, what was sort of US Europe 
is now waning. And you, as, as mentioned in the discussion as well, the BRIC countries are joining together with a buying power of 40% of the world or something like that. And uh, so things will change and there is a chance to do better. But I'm not quite sure how many clients buy chocolate of uh, fair trade in China or in Russia or in Brazil. Is this to the better? I'm not quite sure. So I think we have to keep up our, our values and we have to bring them in and equal rights is one of them. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. I think it's also a very good um, connection, uh, connecting bridge to the, to the next question directed to you, Ms. Fico. Um, and I know it's not an easy question, but was also highly upvoted in the chat. So I'm going to address it to you anyways. Um, what trade system could you imagine after the current system has been revolutionized? My goodness. Over, over to you. <laughs> question for a Wednesday evening. So um, I can think of a few though. So, I mean, the, 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 there's the, the, the post growth well-being movement does offer real potential. Um, and I mean, it, it, it put, and this is where I'd like to really think of us to think around growing ourselves away from the addiction to GDP as the only measure um, and the only way of measuring the health, the wealth um, of, of a, of a, and, and the progress of a society, of a community. It's become the default. And it's, I think there's enough literature now and enough conversation to see that it's not sufficient. So whether you one looks at it from the, con, you know, in the context of climates, which is the very popular at the moment, whether one looks at it in the context of um, trade um, and and the, and and of course the disequilibrium of that, whether one looks at it in terms of the way that it isn't able to really address historical and um, unfortunately the, our history is still with us, historical oppressions and imperialisms and colonial oppressions which are still manifesting themselves in institutions like the WTO and like the IMF and like the World Bank because of the way that the power is skewed in those institutions. Um, and whether this is also in for other forms of geopolitics, right? So, you know, my my as I said before, trade isn't just about trade anymore. It is not just about buying and selling. It is not just a platform where nations come and say, oh, well, you've got cars. Well, I've got airplanes. Well, you've got some uh, mangoes. Well, I've got strawberries. It's not as simple as that. Yeah, it's, it's to do with a lot more than that. It's to do with the exchange and the competition for knowledge. Um, as Mr. Hoffman mentioned, intellectual property, the competition for and, and, the, and the competition to own that knowledge, to monetize that knowledge, to profit and to monopolize that knowledge. This is the thing. Um, it's also around, you know, the way that we have begun to, we've got completely forgotten that um, growth is not only financial. So seven of the fastest growing economies, this, this was the mantra that was going a few years ago, seven of the fastest growing economies and the, the highest grow, highest GDPs um, were, and I think to some extent possibly still are on the African continent, that was pre-COVID. But what is the redistributional effect and impact of that, right? Um, and that's not to say, and, and, that's, and I'm not saying that to fetishize African governance, but I'm saying that in the scheme of things, having a fast GDP or a high GDP has not per se been proven to, to bring a redistributive impact on society. Are there, is there higher infant mortality, for example? Are more people graduating? Are there more houses being built? Is there greater employment? So the kinds of, um, th you know, the kinds of thinking away from the sort of, um, trade up trade architecture that we have now means that we would count the things that matter. Things like um, the distance between your home and your workplace, the quality of that job, um, what kind of work you are doing, but whether you are enjoying it. So countries like Vietnam have already started through their national planning commission. What is a house? A house is a place of rest. It's a house of abode, but it's also a place with internal ablutions. It's a place that is um, secure, that is safe, that is in a neighborhood that is also within easy access of a school, of a public transport system. So it's not just the case of units which are, which are plopped in the middle of nowhere, but it's also about building community and appreciating that we are in community with each other. That is the kind of trade um, 
trading community rather than international trade regime, which is what we have um, at the moment, a trading community. And I, 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 I absolutely agree with Mr. Dr. Hoffman on small businesses, um, family businesses. And this is exactly what international trade unfair trade has decimated across many African countries. It's done exactly. So what might be, what has worked, um, I'm aware that in Italy, in France, Germany, indeed, that these cottage industries are very important, right? Um, to, 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 the, to the lifeblood, the culture, um, the aesthetic of many communities. And this is exactly what the international trade has decimated in many other countries. So I mentioned already that how we've lost a lot of our manufacturing sector, our artisanal capacity because of the huge influx of cheap goods. So in a, in a, in a parallel universe, we would go back or we would go sideways, I'd rather say, to then re, re, reconstituting and regrouping these small economies of scale and rethinking what a value chain even looks like. Why, why if bigger is not always better? I couldn't agree more with Ms. Arkenberg. Bit more is not best. Sometimes less is much, most definitely more. Smaller has got bigger impacts and better effects. And lastly, that of course, this would mean, this would of course mean rethinking and recalibrating away from the primacy of um, the WTO, the IMF. And actually, this is already happening, although nobody's talking about it. So the fact that the Doha round failed in, um, in 2008 um, as well, um, the fact that there's so many bilateral, plurilateral, multilateral agreements which are taking place away from the WTO means that the world is also shifting to different ways of doing trade. Yes, unfortunately, many of them within the same capitalist, neoliberal, Western-led frame, but certainly the primacy of the WTO as the apex of trade-making power has been challenged substantially. Um, thank you so much. Actually, uh, I was taught, or we were all taught in preparation for this discussion to not say thank you so much because it kind of kills the discussion. But in this case, sorry, I have to adhere from that and say thank you so much <laughs> for bringing with me on such a difficult question on a Wednesday evening. <laughs> um, that brings me to my last question um, to you, Ms. Arkenberg. Um, are there any possibilities that the actions of, of fair trade will also w benefit women in the global south that work outside the formal supply chains and outside formal labor markets? Since we talked about informal care work and other informal formal work a lot, um, because the, 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 the audience sees the problem that even fair trade supply chains don't reach a majority of women when they work in informal or private settings. Over to you. Thank you for this question. Uh, alongside degrowth, a major challenge, I would say, especially if we put a focus on rural and agricultural production and the sector where most hard work is unrecognized and remains unrecognized. I think a crucial vehicle is to open up any profits, any protection, any add-on on a universal basis for communities that are affected. So when it comes, for example, to training, to access to health benefits, to social protection, um, to standards that uh, go across uh, communities, especially when it comes to children's education um, and minority rights. Those should be always put as universal standards that go beyond those who are formally recognized and formally contributing uh, to production um, and, and trade. And I think this um, might be a vehicle that must be addressed in any guiding uh, documents and at the core of any uh, trade policy formed and not should be again delegated to amendments and, and optional add-ons but put it must be placed um, first and foremost. Um, so we can, I think, learn um, from uh, what fair trade and how at fair trade is working within communities, but there's always more people to reach out to and more people to open up opportunities to reach formal sectors, well-recognized, decent income and uh, well-paid opportunities. Mm -hmm. Great. Um... Coming to the end of this, this Q&A session, I would take the, the opportunity to thank all everyone in the audience for, for these insightful questions and for keeping the, the discussion alive at this point. And with that, I pass it back to Aaron and Nina.
Um, so the next part of our session will be another Mentimeter. So I'm going to hand over to Jana. All right, thank you very much, Nina. So now that we've already heard so many perspectives for future fairer north-south trade, we would like to once again draw from the collective knowledge of our audience in form of a Menti question. So as before, I have posted the link in the chat and in a second, I will also share the slide with you in case you want to scan the barcode. Here we go. And our question now for you is, what is your personal message for policymakers to implement a feminist trade policy? So as unfortunately, we lack the time to discuss the results of these answers within the framework of this panel discussions, we will be considering them for our final paper on feminist trade policy. So yeah, thank you for everyone who finds the time to participate. And with that, I'll leave it for one or two seconds for everybody to scan the barcode. And with that, I hand back to Aaron. <clears throat> yes, as we are coming to the end of our panel discussion, would like to ask our panelists to each formulate a take-home message in a sentence, what you were able to get from this discussion. I know it's really very challenging. It was it's such a bright topic and it's there is so much to say, but like what will be your take-home message in a very short sentence from the panel discussion today? And I'd like would uh, Ms. Akenberg, would you be happy if would be happy if you begin? Thank you very much. Um, I would say any process that leads to a feminist trade policy must be as lively and diverse as this group has been and must be able to invite voices from across sectors, from across institutions to together join a debate and exchange and be open minded to where it might lead. But we must all recognize that there are some basic values and human rights and women's rights that should be at the focus and center of our efforts. Uh, Dr. Hoffman, I'd like to address you now. Would you agree to what Ms. Arkenberg said or would you frame it differently? In other words, what is your own take home message from today? No, I think uh, I couldn't have said it better than she did. So I completely agree with her. Um, but my point still is we have to have more trade with the global south. We have to have more investment to get these people out of the poorish situation as they are in. So, and we have to have more courage in Germany to do so. Thank you very much. And uh, Ms. Peko, what is your own take home message from our discussion today? Oh gosh, so much. I think I agree quite quite um, with um, Ms. Arkenberg as a, a wordsmith, um, that we need to bring the margins to the center, that we need to visualize that which is invisible, that we need to redistribute power and influence, and that we need to completely upset the, uh, the apple cart. They, we cannot continue to sit around the same table. We need new ideas. We need new tables. We need new chairs. And indeed, we need new homes of thought and of ideation. Yes, uh, thanks to our panelists for their insightful thoughts, diverse and entertaining opinions on the topic, and to our audience also for the questions, the very provoking questions that they asked. I would now hand over to Nina, who would summarize the process we went through today. Yes, wonderful. So today we talked about feminist trade. We talked about free trade and its implication, highly controversial topic. We talked about intersectionality and we talked about post-colonialism, among others. Moreover, we exchanged visions for the future fair north-south trade. We looked at the benefits and necessities for implementing feminist trade policies, the challenges, challenges involved, and looked at positive solutions towards it. It's implementation from both the global south and the global north perspective. Trade is crucial for economic relations and also in meeting the sustainable development goals. We however, acknowledge that feminist trade policy is not a panacea to all problems faced by women and marginalized groups. It's a step in a positive direction. I would now like to take this opportunity to thank all speakers for their time and their openness while sharing their views and expertise in this panel. 
A big thank you also goes to SLE and HBS for giving us this platform, as well as to the audience for staying with us. In the following weeks, we will publish a policy paper, as Jana already mentioned, um, based on today's discussion. So stay tuned. We would also like to cordially invite you to tomorrow's panel discussion on perspectives, perspectives of a just hydrogen transition at 12.30 followed by a panel discussion on the possible ways of international cooperation in Afghanistan at 5 p.m. Uh, Central European time, Central European summer time. <laughs> to improve uh, on our event, we also would like to ask you for your feedback. Um, a link to our Lime survey will be posted in the chat. And we um, yeah, will, would like to ask you to take a few minutes of your time to fill that out. Um, thank you to everyone for your attention, and we wish you a wonderful evening. Thank you.